Hi, everyone. That's an interesting font. All my bullets are coming out at about four millimeters. I don't know what happened there. So, I'm Steve Lochran. I'm with my colleague, Han Gong. This is a talk about Hadoop Yarn Services, which may be readable if those fonts get any bigger on the next slide. Right, this talk is by two of us up there. Shuang Gong in Seattle, he did all the real work. He works on the yarn team, he implemented all this stuff. Me, I just asked for it at the bottom and then broke things and said, oh, this doesn't work. So I'm effectively writing, our, our, our software writing on Slider is effectively the functional test for this work. So I'm, 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 I'm talking about all the work other people did and taking the credit for it. But you have to recognize that it's not my work and you'll know that as soon as you ask me hard questions, okay? Right, so a lot of people have been talking about Hadoop and Yarn and all this kind of stuff. And one way to view it is always viewed as, oh, it's an analytics platform. But really, the Hadoop cluster is a data storage platform with the ability to run code near it. And so, yes, everyone does analytics. Yes, people are running their SQL statements. But it can do a lot more than that. Just like a real computer, yes, you can run MySQL or Oracle DB on it. But you don't have to. You can do a lot more stuff than that. The other interesting thing about a real OS is you can install stuff where you don't have to go to admins. That's important because cluster admins are grumpy people, I'm pointing Alan Witt now here, who, who, to which no is the default answer to all questions generally, unless you phrase them in a, a way that he has to say yes. But generally, if you want to add any new feature then, or run some extra code in it, they'll say no. And in fact, it's a lot better to actually just run something and unless you actually bring the network down or destroy every SharePoint cluster in your organization, you can generally get away and hope they don't notice. So that's, that's what an OS can do. You can run stuff of your choice near the data, on the network, that kind of thing. And really, we can actually do the same within constraints with a Hadoop Yarn cluster. So that's the point, is that more than just analytics, more than just existing workloads. And that's important because if you look at the next generation of applications, they're doing lots of stuff. For example, Kafka. Kafka's at the bottom of all this stuff collecting data. Your data is coming in from so many different places now. It's not just web, web searches and web browsers the way Hadoop was written for. We've got a lot more devices and mobile things and instrumented machinery out there. We've got coffee machines sending shopping requests to Amazon now. We've got Twitter feeds, all this kind of stuff that's coming in. And you want to make sense of it. You want to integrate it. You want to analyze it. You actually want applications to run on this information rather than just print bar charts. So applications got a lot more complicated. And other people are talking about, have been talking all, all week about those applications. I'm worried about the problem of just how do you actually get the whole of that application to run in a single cluster, which you want to do for a couple of reasons. Cost savings, the main one, or oh, it was one of them, but a real one is just, that's where your data lives. You want to run your code near your data in that cluster. You've got the networking. With the multiple machines, you've got redundancy, so you don't have dedicated Kafka servers or anything like that. And you know, treat your, if everyone says, well, the data center is the new computer, then really you want to run anything you want in that data center on the new computer. So, yarn services. Really what that means is any long-lived application running in the cluster, where long-lived is more than a few minutes or you know, a few hours or longer. Here are some of the examples. We'll see if actually anyone in the audience is working on Apache Flink. Hands up who's an Apache Flink developer in the audience. All right, there's Stefan is around. There are some Flink people in the room. They're doing new analytics engine coming out of Berlin. The Hive people, they've got a project for long-lived daemons so they can serve Hive queries in under seconds or not by eliminating all the startup time to, to spawn JVMs and stuff on. They're going to be running in the cluster for hours or more. Apache Samza, the LinkedIn people, they're, they're in a streaming platform. So anyway, it's very similar problems. You're running a program by your data for hours at a time. Spark. You've got medium-lived applications right now. Spark streaming, you can run for days, although they haven't addressed the security problem yet. So it's a, a limit of a day or two on a secure cluster. On an insecure cluster, you can run for a long time there. 
Me and I've been running, I've been working on the Apache Slider project, which is one where we're trying to run non-YARN applications within a YARN cluster by taking on the, the task of talking to YARN, getting the, the capacity, asking, bringing up the applications, dealing with failures and things like that. So under us, we're hosting HBase and Accumulo, things, Storm. And yesterday, there was a talk about Kafka. So Ka Koya, Kafka and Yarn was actually built using this stuff. So that's the work I've been doing, and that's why I've been demanding off the Yarn team all these features and finding out where it breaks. As background, Hadoop Yarn, if you've, you've probably heard lots of talk about it, but let's think about one of the core details here. You have a cluster. You've got HGFS on all the nodes, generally. Each of those nodes that's actually doing work, they're running something called a node manager. This is a process that checks in with the Yarn resource manager, saying, this is what I'm running. This is how much capacity I have. If there is work in the resource manager's queues, and it meets the requirements, the node manager has capacity and CPUs, and maybe in future, disk, disk capacity, then it'll say, here, run this work. Give the node managers the list of URLs effectively to files in HGFS, HTTP, anywhere, downloads them, untars them, or whatever, and executes the command line you've supplied. The node managers also keep track of whether the process is running, whether it's failed. If it fails, they tell the resource manager. So that, that's fundamentally it. It's a platform for downloading and executing binaries off HGFS and then keeping track of whether they're alive. The Yarn resource manager it's the big scheduler for the system. It's the one that decides whose work is going to be scheduled and where as well. When you run an application, the client, whether it's actually an application on the command line or actually something like Hive, it talks to the resource manager and says, the first thing, the one thing I want you to run and schedule is my application master. It gives the binaries, the command line and stuff requirements. Yarn picks it up and starts it anywhere on the cluster. It is that application's run, and it's up to it to make decisions about what else to run and where. If you look at things like analytics work, they say, where is my data? I want to run right next to where my data is. The analytics jobs, they also they care a lot about coming up fast, so they, 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 they say, effectively, I'd rather come up near my data run on the machine along with my data, provided I can start running within a few seconds. So you get the containers, they come up where you are, or nearby. Your application master gets told of them. It knows when they, when they finished. It also gets told when they failed, and it's up to it to choose how to react. In a MapReduce job, things like that, they reschedule the work. This is meant to be side effect free and they start blacklisting nodes to say, we don't actually trust this node. Sometimes they do some handling to say, I'm in a mess, I'm going to stop working. But all these short-lived apps, they have a nice, simple life, OK? They don't have to run for that long, so they, they can not worry about security issues of Kerberos tokens. Yarn can schedule them relatively easily to say, on the data or nearby. The logs, they get created. They'll we wait till the application's finished. The whole Yarn UI is based on that. It basically is either something is running, something 73% complete, or it's finished. So it's a simpler world. You're trying to run something long-lived for days. You, your problems are all changed. You don't do that. You've got to react to failure by not failing, or more precisely, not making that failure visible. So nothing's allowed to fail. Well, things will fail. You, the trick is to try and not expose it. And that includes eliminating the application master as a single point of failure. Right now, you run anything, MapReduce, Tez, Spark, and you find out where the application master is, SSH into that machine and kill it. Entire job is killed, all the containers are destroyed, and it, re -bin, it re restarts from the beginning. They don't preserve their state at all. We don't want that. If I'm going to be running HBase on a cluster, I want it to keep up for months. So, I do not want anything to kill it. Uh, slider AM goes down. That shouldn't be a problem. We just, just count it as a, a failure count to say, this thing's failing a bit too often. Uh, another interesting thing is placement. You don't want to be near where your data is. You might want to be, and this is a recurrent one, you want to be 
away from where your other processes are. If you're carrying about availability and failure, you don't want all your H-based region servers on the same machine, because when that same machine fails, you suddenly discover that you're down. And it's even more subtle than that is, you don't necessarily, because it's dynamic placement, you don't necessarily even realize that all your programs or your region servers are running on the same machine until it goes down. You'd be quite happily running it for a month thinking, oh, this is wonderful. And then suddenly one morning, you know, everyone's going, hey, what happened to HBase? And it's like, oh, I don't know. And then the security. People have been asking me questions about security all week. I think it's wonderful and terrible. We'll get into that. So there's some fun problems, OK? And being an engineer, I like fun. And so we'll be doing something incubation so we can do with fun before it's given to the rest of the world. And by doing the development and testing stuff we've done here, this stuff's becoming ready now, I think. If you are curious about all the things that everybody working on or near Yarn thinks matters on this, go and look up Apache Jira for Yarn 896, which is the complete list of requirements and relatedness of anything we really want for long-lived services. Here are, here are some of those key things. There's lots and lots of them. That's the key thing. We effectively want long-lived services, want to portray, treat CPU and network as resources too, to throttle them. We want to be able to change and resize containers, send, Java, send Unix signals to them, things like that. Well, I've got some good news and some bad news. The good news, a lot of this stuff's in Hadoop 2.6. The bad news is some of the really interesting ones aren't. Um, being open source, of course, any of you in this room are free to implement it. I believe there is a Hadoop committer in the front row who's shaking his heads and not making eye contact. He's not going to do any of these, I'm sure. But he might provide some feedback on them. So what I'm going to talk about this time is actually some, but not all, of the stuff in Slack. I'm going to point out there's some stuff on Docker that's coming up today as well, so you can go and find out about its state in there. I'm not going to talk about that myself. All right, it's value handling. Let's start on the fun one. The application masters, they fail, and more precisely, well, two things could be wrong. Your, your code can be a mess and it fails. Some people have been known to write code that doesn't work or the machine itself can go down. Let's imagine the machine's gone down. The Yarn resource manager, normally it reacts to it by restarting the entire application by, by hand. What we want to do instead is just say, no, the region servers, those containers are running happily. All that hap has to happen is the application master has to be restarted somewhere, and it needs to get told of what's happened. It's given a list of the current containers and a list of things, other things that have failed while it wasn't looking and it's got to try and rebuild its state and carry on. The good news for anyone writing a Yarn application is it's only actually about know, three or four lines of code to turn this feature on. You just say at startup, oh, keep my containers going when I restart. And then when you restart, you say, oh, give me the list of containers that are running. That is the easy bit. The hard part is actually recovering all your state because you just lost everything you had in memory. So you're going to have to think about either persisting it or recovering it. And some of the big apps, they're going to start persisting it. You can't store it in local disk either, because that local disk might have gone away. So it comes down to some form of distributed storage. Right, that's essentially it. It could be Zookeeper. It could be shared memory across the cluster. It could be HGFS. It could be some kind of distributed database. What we do in Slider is we have some very persistent data, which is our cluster configuration, what we want, what the configuration properties are. And that, that's only actually changed by the user. We also try and re remember where things were for best effort placement. But again, if that's not there, we don't really worry about it. What we do is actually try and rebuild our state from those running containers. You effectively just ask them. They, re they report in, and they tell us what they were doing. And we ask out who you are. And say, OK, we've got two region servers running. And they say, are you running or not? And if they were running, we're happy, we leave them alone. If they weren't, it means, oh, it was some kind of installation or upgrade process. And we just kill the containers. We don't worry about trying to, too hard about trying to recover their state. We just blow them away. And everything else, we just re-pick up as we go along. I think our life is simpler. I would be really interested to know how the other applications deal with this. I said, the more complicated state you are, the harder this problem becomes. It also becomes quite fun to test, actually. So if you're curious, we have two ways to test it. We have a, our IPC 
layer to talk to the slider, you have a command called commit suicide, and it just kills itself with a random error code just to see how things react. And we have, we have an integrated chaos monkey. <laughs> integrated chaos monkey. You can use it in production. You just, in the configuration file for a service, you just turn a setting on saying, here is my poll frequency. Here is the probability you pick a random container of yours and kill it without any warning. And here is the probability the AM kills itself. And then we just run our tests. So we're, we're running HBase via slider. We just run all the HBase tests with the chaos monkey at a relatively low level. I mean, you could do it in production. I don't know about that. You, know, you just need to if you're running a cluster Allen's running. But you, you know, it, it's a, it's, that's why I wanted you in the front row. It's somebody to point and make fun of. And so it's, it's actually very good for testing. You know, we have to test all this stuff. Logs, they're the other fun one. Hadoop 2 has a great improvement over Hadoop 1 is that it does actually bring the logs of all your work to HGFS at the end of the system. You can go to the resource manager web UI and have a look at it. You can get it from the command line. Before that, you had to SSH into the boxes to try and get them back. That's really good for that short-lived stuff. The problem is long-lived applications, you do not want to wait until your application has been running for six to eight weeks before your logs get, get pulled over. So that was a, that's a key one to be fixed. Without that, you don't stand a chance of knowing what's going on in your system. Again, it's, it's a single configuration option to turn on. You just say, aggregate the logs. There's actually a couple more flags. You have to say, here is the path to the logs. So you better say, here's my path and here's my pattern. Like if it's rolling logs, you want to say, OK, it's got to be a dot, dot log, followed by a dot, followed by a number. And you better configure log for j or whatever to actually log for it. And then that right, all your logs start getting pulled over at a particular frequency to HGFS where you can keep an eye on it. It's pretty much essential to know what's going on. The fun thing is, and that stuff gets preserved over restarts, the fun thing is still trying to track down which particular container your components are on and what those logs are. I think that's something the application software should really be addressing. Um, I haven't done that bit yet in our code. So we've got logging. Fun one in a real cluster is actually the workload sharing as well. Because Hadoop is biased to, has been biased towards analytics apps, the assumption has been you're running applications that are really hitting the disks. They're scanning through data as much as they can, going through those hard disks. They may be seeking a lot. When they're doing big things in the network, they're doing shuffling. And that's good. It keeps the machines nice and busy. What it's really bad for is if you're trying to run something like HDFS, where you want a really good guaranteed response time, and you can't guarantee that if somebody is running really heavy analytics work on that same machine. What we do here, and historically we've said, oh, well, you're going to need a separate cluster. What we've been working on is the, the, the yarn label stuff, where you can give, well, your admin can give machines labels, bits of the cluster. At which point, when you shed your work, you can attach them to a queue. So you can say, right, this queue, these people, these jobs, they have the production labels. They can run on these machines, which are maybe dedicated. It might be actually just their machines with more RAM or with a GPU or interesting stuff. You can also give machines multiple labels, and that's worth knowing as well. If you're playing complicated labeling games, it's not an exclusive. A machine can only have one name. So labeling. The good news, it gives you more flexibility in actually managing placement and sparing workload. Two bad news. If you are dedicating cluster workload for specific applications, then those machines are going to be underutilized when those jobs aren't running or running spare. That's the price you're going to have to accept. The other bad news, you've got some more thing to manage and keep track of on what's going on. I haven't seen any UI yet. There's a CLI, Yarn RM admin, to let you see what's going on and fiddle with it. And if you're doing it via queues, you've got to make sure those queues to label mappings up and running. The other fun thing is when a machine, say you've got five machines that are labeled, two of them fail, you've only got three machines. So those applications that are trying to run on that, la that label only, they're not going to run. It, it, nothing's going to back off and say, we're going to run the rest of the cluster. They'll sit there with outstanding requests for capacity, for VMs, for region servers, and nothing's going to be satisfied. In that situation, someone is going to have to either relabel the cluster or fix the hardware or even add new machines to the cluster edit the labels to say these new machines have the same label, at which point it will all trickle over. But there's nobody, nobody that's been using labeled code explicitly has actually written their own logic to give up and say at some point I'm going to switch from labeled 
to unlabel because it just it'll just create more confusion about people saying why is HBase running on different machines than I asked. So we have admin problems to deal with crisis. That's that's the trade-off really. Discovery. This is all my code here. If anyone uses this and it doesn't work, I'm the person to blame. We have different ways of well. A fundamental problem in com distributed computing has been finding out where things are running. If you look back in time, there's a first paper written by Xerox on remote procedure calls, this way of talking between machines. They did a follow-up paper about six months later saying, oh, now we have this. We have to find out how the machines can talk to each other. And they came up with the first distributed system registry, really. There's a follow-up paper to that where they talk about actually running that registry, which is quite a fun one too. It's the first operations, this is really hard to do problem. Although they could cheat in those days, they could shut down the registry to do system upgrades, which is something you can't do in DNS these days. We've never been able to shut down DNS to reassign IP addresses across a planet. People, wouldn't, people notice nowadays. Anyway, we, we've implemented a a simpler registry, which is based on Zookeeper. So your application can run and say, when I start, the RM or whatever, it creates a bit of space, a bit of path for me, uses Steve. For my applications that I'm deploying, I have right access to that. I can register my applications in underneath. It's world readable, so anyone can browse around and see what I'm running. They can talk to it. That means applications, other than just my own, can see what I'm publishing. It means that because it's all world readable, we're not, nobody's going to be panicking if at some point we actually implement a DNS bridge to this as well, so we can actually serve these things up as DNS service records. And you can also use this for internal binding. So the way our slider code works is when the app master fails, all those running containers, it's just gone. They, know to, they, they, they can't talk to their app master anymore. They've left the problem of how do they find it and start talking to it again. And the answer is, they look up the registry. It's all in Zookeeper. We use the Python code just to talk to, I think, whatever it is, some Python thing. And <laughs> some Python thing. This is not a bash thing, come on. Some, some Python code to grab this and just, just rebind to it. And let's keep going. We've also lifted the notion from the LinkedIn Helix people having internal and external links. The internal are the ones we say for the application here. The external ones are things that could be published. The idea is, at some point in the future, it would be nice to do a decent UI for this, and actually maybe even proxy some of the REST APIs outside your cluster. That would be nice to say if you're running your web services or your YARN services inside a YARN cluster that's hosted somewhere intern externally, like any cloud infrastructure, the external ones could actually be published and relayed outside the cluster. The internal ones we keep private. Security. Mm. Hands up who is running a cluster, a Hadoop cluster with Kerberos turned on. Keep your hands up if you enjoy it. Okay, he's not natural, but he helped add that feature. And you're only doing that because you're being polite to him. All right, Kerberos. Metaphorically, it is like the seven-headed dog that guards hell or something like that. Is that right? All right, three-headed. Okay. I consider it actually to be hell itself. It's not a metaphor. Okay. It's like some unnatural beast that fails with obscure error messages when you can actually get it working. Kerberos error messages are wonderful in their complete, utter irrelevance. I say that having worked on some of the Hadoop error messages. So... It's a pain, but at the same time, it works. It works really great for securing stuff across machines. When you have it turned on and the resource negotiation stuff, you even your web browser, like Firefox and that, uses your Kerberos tokens to actually authenticate with your entire infrastructure. Yarn will even proxy it so that if I want to hit a web UI in my Yarn service, I talk to the RM proxy in the web browser, it proxies it, and it's authenticated by the Iron Proxy. So it's, it's not just securing your data, it secures your applications too. Your applications running in the YARN cluster, they need to be authenticated too. They need to access your data. They need to authenticate as you, maybe to talk something like H, HGFS to HBase to Zookeeper. They need those rights, your rights, 
for any short-lived application, your client creates delegation tokens. They talk to the Kerberos server to say, I would like a token to grant something else the right to talk to HGFS, to talk to Zookeeper a bit. The Kerberos server gives those tokens, but a key part of the Kerberos design is that those tokens expire. That's absolutely critical for security reasons. Otherwise, someone would get your token and then it just, that's it. You, not only would they be able to do what they want, you wouldn't even know that they were being abused. So they expire and that limits the amount of damage a lost token can do. That's okay for those short-lived services because if you're running a few minutes, a few hours, it works really well. You don't notice you have any problems. Where it does cause problems is long-lived services because approximately 72 hours by default after you started running, your tokens expire. At that point, you can't talk to HGFS anymore, at which point you, those rolling logs we were talking about fill up the stack traces. Um, the rolling log stuff, that, that, that actually, Yarn handles that, okay? It will still grab those stack traces and pull them over. That bit is handled. What Yarn does not do is actually handle the task of pushing out, giving you your application new tokens to talk to, HGFS, Zookeeper, and the like, and renew them. Why isn't that done? The answer is, is because in the Yarn team, they didn't want to be propagating insecurity, if that makes sense to you. There's too much risk that we'd be passing out security tokens that would then then get abused, and generally you've just downgraded security. So, it doesn't happen. After 72 hours, any program running in a Hadoop cluster is in trouble. So what are you going to do about that, apart from turn security off? Well, the default action is do nothing. That's how most applications start. If you're running for less than a few hours, or, you know, or just a day or so, it doesn't actually matter. A lot of the, the, we have kind of, I say medium life, yarn services run for a day. The ones where someone comes in the morning, starts a, a session on something like a Spark session, leaves those machines up and running, those containers. At the end of the day, they turn it off or whatever. So it doesn't matter. You're inside the lifespan of the tokens. Also, if you're going to production stuff, you might ever have to have a separate solution for production things, but during development, you don't want to have, have any hassle of actually doing anything more complicated. Some applications, one application, Apache Twill, which is a library for writing your own applications, they, they rely on tokens all the time, but what they do is let you, your client's application, generate new tokens and push them up. Provided you trust the client you're talking to, I mean, the, the, the application master you're talking to, that's a nice, simple way of fixing the problem except you do have to run that client every, every day or two just to keep pushing out those new tokens. Either you run it on your laptop and it never fails, or you set up something like an easy job to do the renewal. The other solution, the one that is probably the most rigorous, is to create a key tab. That's where whoever it is that looks after Kerberos runs some Kerberos commands to export the rights to say, okay, this can run as this user on this machine. And you get a file key tab, which you then need to transport very securely round to all those machines. Anyone running HBase in a secure cluster will have already hit this problem, because HBase, Accumulo, and those kind of things, they use those key tabs to deal with, deal with the security renewal problem there. In Slider, we say, give us the same key tab. If you're planning on running a long-lived application talks to HGFS, it's up to you or it's up to the application to solve it for themselves, we will just take that same key tab and we will, you can propagate it both to the slider app master and to those containers we deploy via HGFS. We're using that, it works. The price is you go and have to talk to those admin people at that point to say, look, I want to run a long living application, give me a key tab. Some organizations, they, they really don't like giving them out. I'll, Point to Yahoo as an example of people that like to lock their things down. In that situation, you're going to have to go back to client push, I think. There's one more subtly different one related to key towers, which is what is not yet implemented in Spark. So Spark and Spark Dreaming, they, they, they currently die after 72 hours. There is a patch coming from Intel that's going to rely on the app master having a key tab 
but it does not propagate the key tab to all the Spark worker nodes. Instead, they're going to look and say, oh, my time's about to run out. Ask the key, the slider, sorry, the Spark app master for a new key tab or new tokens and get it back. There's going to be some interesting authentication problems there. You're going to have to make sure that the app master doesn't issue out token renewals to somebody that it doesn't trust. I think, you know, I think, I think we'll have to do an experiment there. Okay, that's the problem. Once you're dealing with security, you've got to deal with security holes. Life's a lot simpler if you just say everything's wide open. Actually, that's not true. One of the funny things also is actually how Yarn runs applications where in an insecure cluster, you have one user called Yarn that all your jobs run as, and your identity to talking to HGFS is passed down by an environment variable called Hadoop user. So you talk to, you run your job, you submit your work, it may run as the user yarn, you're talking to HGFS as, as Steve or whatever, and you don't notice that there's not a user called Steve actually on the cluster. It all works really well. When you're running a long-lived service, it's actually running as the account, in this cluster, it's running as the account yarn, which causes surprises for things like, say, talking to HGFS, not HGFS, NFS, for example, as you're coming in as the user yarn, run the user Steve. That causes surprises, I think, is the way to do it, but the answer is, well, that's an integral cluster. If you're running securely, you have to have a user ID, I mean, a, a, a user account in the cluster for each individual user. It gets mapped through some obscure mapping file from your username to that user, and then your jobs will run as you at that point. So then you can say, I have a real user called user HBase, which we run HBase as. So security does help, it's just got a price. Anyway. With all these things that I've gone through, those people that want to write Yarn applications can now do them. They can run programs that run for months at a time. Some of the things Yarn handles, like log collection, some of the registry stuff, some things the applications have to work with Yarn, such as the placement problem, dealing with restarts. Some of the things are purely up to app developers, how on earth they handle application failure, how they do security token renewal. But it's interesting that everyone writing a secure service hits exactly the same problem. In fact, one time I was, uh, I was over at LinkedIn with Samsung, we were just doing code review of our own code, and there's almost like similar bits of code in the system. I think maybe we should tease some of this stuff out and make it a library. All right, that's where we are today. If you go back to that list of things that are there, there are still quite a few outstanding. People also added the ability to say, I want hard disks, real physical hard disks to be a resource. And that's for things like Kafka and that. They want real non-HGFS disk capacity. And that's storage capacity and effectively disk head capacity. So you can actually say, I want a dedicated physical disk or the IOPS equivalent of a physical disk over SSDs. Two things I've got to highlight as I find recurrent problems, anti-affinity and placement. The problem of, you know, discussed before, I want to run my applications, my containers on different machines for availability and potentially performance. So by default right now, I would ask Yarn for a couple of containers, so this much memory, this much CPU. It's not just that Yarn picks it at random. There's actually a bias towards giving you on the same machine. And that actually happens because the node manager reports in saying, I have this much space. And Yarn goes, oh, that's good, because I actually have two applications, each wanting a fraction of that, so it pushes them straight down. So there's actually this bias towards affine placement, as it were. Right now in Slider, we're not dealing with that explicitly. We just remember when we restart, we, we don't ask for, we, we try and remember when we restart where containers were and ask them back. We don't ask for more than one container on the same machine if you want anti affinity. I might have to spend some time implementing this whole thing myself in which my application would do the work of, we would list the entire cluster or machines in a label and just ask for different requests, saying, okay, I want any of the machines of these 10 machines, I want any of these nine machines, eight machines, seven machines, and do it that way. And that's kind of ugly and painful coding. I'd really like it to be done by the Yarn team. But at least I can have a workaround. The one, the other one that's fun is actually REST APIs. So you can bring up a web server in a Yarn application. In fact, all of them do, even the short-lived ones do, the long-lived ones do. You bring up the REST server, REST server, you register it with Yarn to say, here is the URL of, my, rep, of my, my web server. 
that web server comes up and it listens for requests, but has a little filter in there that rejects all requests that come from a machine other than the Yarn resource manager. It just goes, oh, don't like you, and sends a 302 back saying, go to the resource manager, the RM proxy. It's called resource manager proxy and ask it instead. The resource manager proxy, it's the one that does all the authentication, the Kerberos authentication and that. It does a reader, it, it does that, it acts as a proxy which actually gets your content, does some bits of some rewrites and stuff like that, and fetches it back, so it proxies it. That works really well for web UIs. However, whoever implemented it has only heard of the HTTP verb get. And it's generally considered bad form to have major side effecting operations implemented as a get request. So we want to support basic things like post and put and get and delete, and it's not handled. And there's two things that need to be fixed there. The simple one is that when the app master bounces requests from its web UI to the RM proxy, we have to send a 307 back rather than a 302 saying re, re issue the same request HTTP verb as you did before. And then the RM proxy actually has to forward that. Okay, so that, that's not something I can work around except by the cheating option of having our own little filter to do that issue that redirect API and just open up a bit of the URL space and say, let's just, just don't redirect this bit. Just be completely wide open and handle it, and we'll not worry about security. So actually, in Slider, we've done that purely for testing. Okay, <laughs> purely for testing and experimentation. You know, yeah, actually, it, it's, it's turned off by default. It means actually our code's there. It's just that it's not actually useful right now. You know, so we, 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 even though we wanted to move off the IPC to a pure REST API, we can't. We run them side by side, okay? Same API, we test. In an insecure cluster, I could actually turn that feature on and say, oh, it's insecure, it doesn't make any difference. But then people will get lazy and start using it and then get surprised when they run the secure cluster that everything breaks. So really, someone, and that nodding was someone in the front row volunteering, needs to do a proxy that is actually a proxy. So that's probably it, more things to do. Um, if you're curious, you want to see some code for this, all those projects I listed at the beginning, they're all open source, you can download this stuff and you can see where it's done. I will point you at the incubator stuff slider, slider incubatorpatch.org. We have probably one of the most complicated failure handling and restart bits of code out there. If somebody wants to deal with writing yarn code that wants to deal with failure restart, come and talk to us, can level that code. If you're doing things like security, I think all the different implementations have their own solution to the problem, and they're all worth looking at to see how. Well, they're worth looking to see what they did, but basically first you find out what they did, and then you decide whether you want to copy it, and then you go and look at that particular project's bit of code. And of course, going back to that big list of things we want done, it's all open source. Everyone has the right to implement those features in a future version of Hadoop. Um, I have that right too, it's just kind of always like to delegate it. Hard things testing it actually, and also it takes a while for these things to ship. Now, are there any questions from the audience about this stuff? No questions? Yep, yeah, we have a question. Um, what, what if you run um, something like a web shop in, uh, in, in such, as, uh, such a container? Uh, and you want uh, the external users to be easily load balanced over all the containers. Okay. Uh, what, what kind of solutions exist there? The question was that, say I run some kind of application, web serving application in the cluster, how do I do load balancing? We don't do anything for that. Okay, I think that's the basic answer. You could play games with sharding. You, got, you, you could run some load balancer thing that then does the redirect to real computation. One of the problems with applications like that is actually you're going to have to bounce the clients over to it because the URLs and the ports aren't fixed. So you're going to be, you're going to be perennially doing that. That's where the registry stuff could work. You could imagine doing something that looks at the Yarn registry for the URLs of every singly registered container and then redirects it using all the verbs or more importantly proxies it over. Okay. Um, the, uh, that, that's probably it. There's one other thing which actually we haven't done in slide yet is you also want to detect when one of those things has gone down. You don't want to redirect to a dead Tomcat. Oh, that's tasteless. The, 
There's a funny, actually, that one of those things I've, have, I've done pre, pre yarn was another project where we, we were using one of those fancy level seven load balancer things to redirect work to web app queues of the servers behind that were settling the work. And one of the machines failed, and it was like, I think it was about 16 machines, so it should have been just like a sixteenth of the, the, the capacity failed. But it turned out that actually something like a third of the requests started failing instead. And it just happened that actually what happened is that machine had failed by rejecting all requests with a 500 internal server error, so its queue was the shortest. Okay, everything was doing lots of work, but everything goes, oh, this machine's really fast, I'll give it more work. So it actually, the, the load balancer amplified the damage. So it, it's not enough to have a load balancer, you've actually got to have better integrated monitoring of what's going on and the load manager making smart decisions. Uh, one of the things, the Helix project, the Apache Helix that's at LinkedIn, they were trying to do the work, actually they would scale up and scale down their cluster based on load. That's the other thing you could do, actually, is say, oh, I've got more requests coming in, let's make myself bigger. I do not know how they address the problem of actually redirecting work to that. I presume it's the back end, for some reason, the complicated application chain, where it was just doing back end processing and not front end web serving. Okay. And a former LinkedIn employee is nodding about that design there. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Niels, okay. okay. Okay, the question is, if a container dies and it comes back up, will it have a different IP address? If it comes up on a different machine, yes. If it comes up on the same machine, no. So the question is, how do you get the container back up on the same machine? It's application-based, okay? What we do in Slider is you can actually tag any particular component type to say what your placement policy is, which is, I don't actually care. So when it goes down, we just go back and say, Jan, say, give me anything anywhere I want. We have one that says strict, that says it must be on the exact machine it was before. In which situation, we not only ask for it back, but if that machine's down, we don't care. We just say, oh, okay, well, that machine, that's waiting. We just hang, out for it, hang around for it to come back. We had to change our web UI view to be very clear about why things aren't working, actually, just to make it quite clear that it's not that this thing isn't working, it's just that we have an outstanding request for this machine kind of thing. Then the other option, which I spent a while doing actually recently, was handling the escalation of placements ourselves. So historically, we would schedule work to Yarn to say, I want a container on this machine. If it's not satisfied, fall back to elsewhere in the cluster. Yarn, because it's written for short-lived applications, its escalation time, when it decides to fall back from a specific machine to anywhere in the cluster, is about a second or two. It says, right, we would rather have analytics throughput and performance over absolute data locality, because the assumption there is actually, okay, the reason we want data locality is to save on network performance, but once you're down for more a second or two, network performance, you're spending more time waiting for the container to come up, then you'll be saving on network traffic, especially networks have got faster now. Long live application, don't want that, so we, ri we ripped we, we added lots and lots of layers of tracking ourselves, so we actually do the escalation ourselves. So now I can actually add a policy which says, on a region server, after I'm down, wait 15 minutes before I ask for somewhere else. And that way we have an intermediate ground between I come back exactly on the machine I asked for versus anywhere in the cluster. Now there's another problem, which is that even if it comes up on the same machine, it might come up on a different port. Okay. Some discussion there is actually, should we be able to actually have Yarn to do port allocations as well, which says, right, I want six machines, this much CPU, this much hard disk, and I want port 8083. That really complicates placement. Don't think we'd do that. What might be better was the node manager to do allocation of ports, saying, I would like a free port, and it just kind of manages the space to say, here is a port within this range, and just publish it in. One of the fun things is, you shouldn't be having applications that have hard-coded ports in. That's rule one, because they're going to get into a mess with the rest of the cluster. So normal practice is I just start open a port zero and say, right, I get allocated one. You don't have to pass that information about IP address and port back, which is where we use the registry for right now. That's where we publish it. 
some organizations, they also have firewalls turned on, so you can't just say any port, it's got to be in a range. So we also added a feature, we had to add a feature for saying, I give a range that says, I want to assign a port between 6,000 and 6,500 for this particular service. And then other agents running on all the containers, they have to do a port scan to find the first free port within that range. They hand it to the application like HBase and configure it, say, okay, you're gonna bring up HBase REST server port 6117 and then bind that information back up. So, poor allocation. Okay, so how would the HBase client find it? Yes, if we publish something like that, it would have to be via the registry. HBase application uses Zookeeper to find itself, actually. So HBase is a very nice application for dynamically deploying around a cluster, because apart from the HBase REST server and the HBase Thrift server, everything is fully distributed. You just you out, your clients just need to know the Zookeeper URL. Or you, the, yeah, yeah, the Zookeeper cluster name and the just the path under it, and that's all they can get away with. Now, there's one bit of extra entertainment there, which is in a cloud environment, your Zookeeper machines aren't fixed. If they fail, they may come back out with different IP addresses. Okay, and. The answer for that is we use Netflix Curator as our Zookeeper library. There's actually a plugin above Curator, whose name escapes me, where it can actually look up something like Amazon S3 to retrieve the file that tells it what the Zookeeper quorum is. So you have this quite complicated fallback mechanism of saying, okay, we find HBase where they are by using Zookeeper, and we have to find out where Zookeeper is first. Yeah. For my SQL client, Yes, you probably have to do something complicated that way. The thing about my SQL client is because it's actually saving stuff to local hard disk, it's not very good at handling failures in this world unless you can prepare to lose all the data. Or you have something running in the background to snapshot and back it up to HGFS every minute or two. Any more questions? Yeah. Over there, Thomas. Hey, um, you Hi. mentioned like resource sharing, sharing disks, sharing network. I mean, sharing disks, I can easily imagine that that's fine to do. Sharing network, um, I can see some easy ways to do, do that immediately, but Alan would s categorize them as the part of the not working Hadoop. So can you get explain like a way to share network that Alan would actually approve? Good, I'm not going to. Um, one of the things is that your yarn containers <laughs> Right, your Yarn applications run a container, and on both Linux and Windows, there is some actually resource management around it. So you can actually play with the LXC container APIs, which right now are just used to limit memory. You can actually throttle the CPU. You can also say, here's my I.O. and here's my network bandwidth, so you can play these games. One of the problems for I.O. is that actually a lot of the I.O. that is taking place on behalf of an application is actually taking place in the HDFS process. So, I can't have an, app, an application, say an analytics application says, right, I'm going to throttle its HGFS I.O. to this many megabytes a second per container because Linux containers can't handle that. We are more, more going to think, okay, could we have HGFS do some priority queuing or something complicated like that? Network I.O. itself? Mm. Maybe Linux containers is the thing to do, of course, though. If you're using HGFS, you might be using that network port both locally and remotely to actually do the network so it could indirectly hurt I.O. performance. There you go. Yarn 3365. Is the I want, was that the I.O. and network scheduling? That's the one where I said, that's really hard, isn't it? Are you sure it's going to work? Because we were talking to Red Hat and they're saying, that's not going to work. You know that, don't you? So there we go. Now, somebody over here had a hand up for a question earlier as well. Maybe not, yeah, way over there. Uh, uh, my question is uh, uh, about the general use cases. Is it the, the, the slider that is slider the target for all long running applications such as uh, Solar, HBase, or? No, no, no. Um, it was the goal of saying we can run applications that don't need to be written specifically for Hadoop in a Hadoop cluster, provided they meet a lot of the requirements, which is they don't need persistent storage in local file systems. They can handle being destroyed on a whim. 
That's how we handle shutdown, by the way. We don't have a clean shutdown. We just destroy. You better design for that. And we don't have to have things like fixed IP addresses and ports. The, if you look at what's going on, there is lots of people now writing applications to run within a YARN cluster who are explicitly doing all the work themselves or as much as they want to. I think that what we did with Snyder is we did some of the leading edge stuff. We found it first. We're a very big chunk of the regression tests for some of this stuff going on. Like we were getting emails over the weekend saying our tests weren't aggregating the logs, and it turned out somebody had changed something in Yarn. You know, so it's kind of we're the regression test, but actually we're only supporting a few specific applications where we've designed to make it easy to bring other applications to run the Yarn cluster without having to do all the low-level stuff of dealing with failures and allocation and talking to Yarn and all that kind of stuff. So if you want an application that's just fairly simplistic, I'm going to run against HGFS data, then it works. Apache Twill is another one I really recommend you look at as well. If you want to run simple code in the Yarn cluster, you effectively write thread handlers, routines, that then get pushed out and distributed and executed. So it's very nice. They gave a talk on Berlin Buzzwords last year on that, where actually I was using it to render. It was basically little tool routines actually said, OK, here is a URL to a photograph in HGFS. Here's some text. Go render it. And you could do frame rendering that way. And it's just, OK, I'm going to run it in the cluster. And it was only about, it was only about 10 lines of code in the depths of the Java GUI JPEG APIs that haven't been touched since 1997. So that was the hard part, was finding the Sun documentation from that era the era where they thought SVGA was a high-resolution thing that would use lots of memory. OK, so you know, you, you, people doing interesting big applications, I'll point out Apache Flink people who are around they haven't spoken already are doing some pretty cutting-edge stuff. The other one that's getting a lot of investment right now is Spark, uh, Spark on Yarn and Spark Streaming. I'm actually getting involved there as well. I'm doing some of the stuff. And it's funny because even though it's written in Scala, it's exactly the same problem. So in fact, they've been cutting and pasting some of my code into Scala code, which is very nice, because IntelliJ idea, if you paste from Java into Scala, it actually changes the language as you go along. So my patches are basically, I'm going to take this class, paste it over there, and I'll pretend it's Scala. And so it's, it's a recurrent problem. Sorry, I didn't, shouldn't have admitted that. At least the camera's off. It's, oh, it's not. OK. I'm writing lots of innovative Scala work. It's really fascinating. I'm so much enjoying functional programming. <laughs> I don't. I was actually taught functional programming by Milner, who wrote ML, so he'll probably beat me up from his grave for saying negative things about it. All right. That's, any more questions, or are we time up now? I'll be around the rest of the day if you want to bother me about stuff as well. <laughs>